music is not the only artistic sphere in which unknowns can have an important role. Once you start looking, you'll find artists playing with unknowns in nearly all realms, from drama to digital. And this isn't new. In the arts, traditions of exploiting chance elements, improvising, relinquishing control to other agents or forces, go back a long way. Sasha Grisham is an art historian. His research areas include 19th and 20th century art and contemporary art, especially Australian and European art, and also medieval art, especially Byzantine and Russian art. Professor Grishin was elected to fellowship of the Australian Academy of the Humanities in 2004 and awarded an Order of Australia for service to the visual arts and to contemporary Australian artists as an educator, critic, and writer and as an art historian in 2005. He was kind enough to let me interview him on the roles that unknowns play in the visual arts. Well, Sasha, of, of several years ago, you wrote a chapter for uh, Gabrielle and my book um, describing how artists harness and cultivate uncertainty um, in, their, in their work. Now, I think probably a lot of us think of art still as something that requires a lot of control and mastery. So there's this kind of vision of uh, an almost um, omnipotent uh, artist fully in control of his or her medium or technique. So, so how does that kind of sit with uh, making things uncertain or, uh, or having accidents or anything like that? I think basically there's two different ways of thinking about it. One is to say that an artist is a complete control freak when it concerns materials, and some artists are like that. In other words, the thing is all worked out almost like a battle campaign. Uh, yes, th there's a small sketch made, then that's made into a larger design, then that's transferred to canvas, then bits and pieces are coloured in, and the whole thing is resolved very, very much in a very rational, certain manner. And there's a completely different philosophy of art making, which is to surrender to chance, surrender to uncertainty. And thinking about that recently, I think it underlies a rather a fundamental difference between, if you like, a humanist perspective and an anti-humanist perspective. And I'll be very careful to uh, explain what I mean by that. Now, a humanist perspective is the sort of idea as man as the measure of all things. Uh, the person is the most important thing and everything is relative to it. An anti-humanist perspective is, as it implies, the exact opposite. Uh, man is one composite element. All other parts of nature have, if you like, equal importance. So that a dog, a fly and a tick become, if you like, parts of that universe and have their own uh, authentic authority and autonomy about it. Uh, very early in the piece there was a movement in Europe that was born around the period of the First World War, the Great War, uh, that is referred to generally as Dada. And the artists of Dada uh, essentially made this idea of chance as a central creative principle. One of the most famous examples was there was a particular artist who goes under several different names, but let's just call him Hans Arp. Um, and he made a drawing, and he wasn't happy with the drawing, so he tore it up, threw it over his shoulder, and left the room. The next morning came back and saw where the bits and pieces had landed, and thought, wow, this is something I couldn't actually achieve with my conscious mind, but somehow by allowing chance to play a role, uh, then this is rearranged in a particular order or pattern, that is far, far more interesting and creative than what I could do with my rational, controlling mind. Is this solely a modern uh, concept, or, or, or does it go further back than that? I mean, were there well, artists in the, uh, you know, before World War I yeah. who, who did these sorts of things? Yes, I, I think probably before the Great War um, in art history, uh, frequently it goes under the name of inspiration. Now, where does that germ of inspiration come from? Now, one of the greatest sort of, if you like, control freaks in the history of art was Leonardo da Vinci. 
is a person who would spend hours looking at the motion of water, hours looking at geological formations, making precise studies of the human anatomy. And um, all of these elements he saw was uh, in some ways empowering the artist to become a godlike character, one who can create. So in other words, this idea that, that if there is some sort of omnipotent god, uh, then the artist, really to become a godlike character, must have the same skill box as God has, must know geology, must know natural sciences, mathematics and everything else. But, and this is the huge and exciting but, how do you actually start a work of art? And in one of his throwaway lines in the Trattata del Pittura, uh, Leonardo says, well, one day you'll be just sitting, sipping from a glass of wine, and you'll be looking at this rock ledge opposite, where you'll notice pea stains. And looking at those most incredible patterns within those pea stains, you'll see landscapes and other things that you're conscious mind could never have imagined. So if you like there's this idea that you're looking for the chance occurrence in nature which is the spark of, of inspiration that leads to the creation of these works. So one could say that this whole idea of looking outside that which is um, definable, controlled, that which is very finite uh, does go back a very long time. So after Dada, are there major movements that uh, that really are mainly about harnessing uncertainty, or does this remain kind of a, um, if, a sort of a sideshow? Dada, Dada, sorry, I've interrupted you. Dada never dies. Uh, Dada gained his conscious uh, expression uh, at the beginning of the 20th century. But subsequently, whether you call it Neo-Dada or give different titles, it continues. Once that principle of um, chance had been harnessed by artists, then yes, it goes into a lot of uh, directions. Uh, frequently, um, people involved in the environmental art, they are very, very um, consciously working in trying to bring into their artwork the voice which is not of the artist. Now that's slightly different from what you and I were speaking about earlier. Mm. If Arp and the uh, Surrealists believe that somehow uncertainty unlocks, if you like, the subconscious, uh, artists working within an environmental movement, people like Richard Long or in England or John Wolseley in Australia, uh, they're more concerned with the idea saying, well, the artist perhaps should be more like a medium and to allow the other elements of nature to speak through the artist. And say, in particular in the case of John Wolseley, uh, he would do th such things as, after there's been a bushfire, go with sheets of paper and allow them to be dragged over the burnt charcoal twigs. And one of the most remarkable things that he found is that no uh, two burnt trees had the same voice. You know, some of us who are not familiar uh, with the bush intimately look at it and say, well, this looks like there's been a bushfire here. Everything's black and burnt. Uh, but actually, a particular type of banksia makes a particular mark after it's been burnt. A eucalypt makes a different sort of mark. A grevillea makes a different sort of mark. And so almost, these, when you put all these marks together, they create an environment, an ecosystem, in which now the missing living elements are there. So nature starts to, if you like, uh, create a self-portrait in its own terms. The artist becomes al almost like a medium or a manipulator to allow the self-portrait to appear. Okay, so, so the... At the extreme, then, the artist isn't actually making marks him or herself, but Act instead yeah. uh, uh, animals or insects or plants. Yes, yes. I mean, for example, um, just le leaving to the case of uh, Wolseley, because simply he is an Aust Australian artist. He came here in 1976, so he's been here for a number of years, although he did have an English reputation before he arrived. Um, one of his uh, favourite ploys is to actually... Uh, 
take a sheet of paper, perhaps have a drawing on it, rip it in half, put half the drawing into a folio, and the other half uh, secrete it in a hollow tree under um, dry desert sand and leave it there sometimes for a number of years and then come back, extract it and join them up and just have a look what's happened to that paper that's been out uh, in the elements uh, the markings made by insects uh, seepages, various sort of um, ferric oxides that transfer to these there's become these wondrous patterns that are created uh, within this and yes, uh, as, as you put it correctly, I don't think the artist sees, um, it's very much opposite to the Leonardo da Vinci idea, the artist is the God creator. Here the artist is, if you like, the facilitator. Uh, the artist is here uh, to see if he can give nature its own voice. Hmm. So has anybody, are, are, people, are artists taking this kind of approach to... Um, in a sense, the artificial environment. Yes, you've got that happening, but also if you think about, say, an artist like Rosalie Gascoigne. Now, uh, she w didn't actually paint things, she assembled things. But I think one of the beauties of her work is that she would assemble things that had a certain patina already created in nature. And she quite often would use artificial areas, things like road signs, mm. which she then would cut up, rearrange, put together and what was very important was those road signs already carried with them if you like traces of earlier existences so when you actually came to them and some of her works uh, can be thought in terms of environment images or landscape images they have a certain power about it uh, some of it's because she arranged things in a particular way other things that she's had actually the uh, genius to see things with fresh eyes and suddenly to realize that they can be pulled together and we all start seeing uh, things differently. So do you foresee um, uh, any, any further uh, developments um, along, along these sorts of lines or, or have artists kind of scoped out the artistic possibilities? Um, to be honest, I always think um, all of these things as adding to the artist's toolbox. It's really, I think, a question of the creative use of all of these different strategies and techniques and also feeling the confidence that you don't actually have to control everything. You don't have to sort of uh, be a dictator, but you can actually allow many other a polyphony of voices to enter into your composition and but have that, like in Rosalie Gascoigne's uh, case, the genius to be able to hear them and guide the process mm. to something that is resolved that you and I will look at and say, oh, this is most incredible, this is most wonderful. Well, have we pretty well exhausted everything? As far as I can tell. Or okay. <coughs> no, there's nothing you specifically want me to talk about, is there? Not that I can think of. Okay. Well, a pleasure. Great.